Hello class. So uh, today we start our unit on uh, the communist era of Poland. Um, and this is often referred to as the PRL or PRL. Uh, and that just means the Pols Polska Rzeczpospolita Ludowa. Um, often uh, uh, not hyphenated. <laughs> the acronym is PRL, PRL. So Polska Rzeczpospolita Ludowa. And all this really means is, you know, uh, Polska is Polish, Rzeczpospolita is Republic, Ludowa is of the people. Um, and you, you know, you have no memory of this, but um, I remember, you know, uh, communist states always had these very long uh, name official names because you know they wanted to make sure you knew that it was a democratic state, um, even though they weren't. Um, so, for example, like North Korea isn't just North Korea; it's the People's Democratic Republic of North Korea, even though it's it's definitely not democratic. Um, so, the PRL lasts from 1947, just after World War II, to 1989, and so um, in the aftermath something dramatic here in the aftermath of World War II. Um, the Soviets have influence and control over much of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so if you'll remember the documentary that you watched uh, for uh, World War II and the Holocaust, um, the, uh, the reason the Warsaw Uprising took place, even though it was destined to fail, um, is because the leaders of Poland, who were in exile, really, knew that if they could at least, you know, in Pol in, in in on Poland's own turn in Poland's own terms, um, if they could liberate Warsaw before the Soviets came in, um, they could plant the Polish flag and Poland could remain independent. Soviets knew this and they weren't about to let that happen. So they just waited on the other side of the river and let the Nazis completely wipe out the Polish existence. And then they went in and claimed the rubble for the Soviet Union. Um, and so in Poland, um, as in much of Eastern Europe where the Soviets uh, held influence, um, Stalin installed his own friendly communist uh, politicians um, to be the new leaders of a communist Poland. Um, now, something to keep in mind, though, is that this didn't happen everywhere. Um, in some places, communist governments were democratically elected, for example, in Czechoslovakia. Now, you know, obviously with propaganda, but, you know, there's propaganda on all sides in any kind of election. Um, but the people freely elected the communists in Czech Czechoslovakia, which, you know, uh, they ended up regretting maybe, but um, this was this is an important. Uh, I think this is an important historical um, uh, event to keep in mind is that not all communist regimes in Eastern Europe were installed. Some people chose them uh, and chose them freely. But anyway, um, so as um, so, Poland is completely reshaped after World War II. Um, uh, there's there are plenty of maps. You just Google like Polish map. Uh, pre-World War II, Polish map, post-World War II. Be, in order to keep Stalin happy, the Allies just let him take for the Soviet Union, uh, you know, the eastern third of, of Poland. And to make up for this, they gave him a little land that had been German, hadn't been Polish in generations. And I mean, the entire area was all German. Um, and so its borders just shifted and they end up losing a ton of, of, of land area. Uh, they lost a lot of important historical cities, like uh, the city of Lvov. Um, uh, now called Lviv in Ukraine. Uh, this was a, a Polish built historically Polish city. And this was one of the things that um, that the allies just freely gave to, to, to Stalin. Um, because they, you know, they, they didn't want him of getting out of the war, uh, they wanted to keep him happy. And so Poland's borders shift to the West and um, it's basically the same borders that they have today. Uh, there are a few little changes, but nothing drastic as what happened uh, after World War II. 
And it's, it was a weird situation that that happens. Um, they kick out all the Germans who had been whose families have been living there for generations. Um, and even today, there there are these um, exiled German families, or I can't remember their official name, but in Germany, basically fascists uh, who want that land back. And I mean, that's just not going to happen. But they keep doing these weird right wing nationalist marches and whatnot. But anyway. Um, but, you know, you have this huge tract of land, the best developed land even in Poland today. It's funny, if you look at like a Polish railway map, uh, the railroads in the east are like, they're so sparse, they're barely any, but the second you get to what was once Germany, there's just railway everywhere. So, <laughs> um, but so they kick out the Germans um, uh, and they, and then you have all this empty land. And so what they do is they take Poles, and a lot of people didn't even really think of themselves as Poles. They thought of themselves as Belarusians or, or uh, Ruthenians or Ukrainians from what was Eastern Poland. And they trans picked them up and transported millions of people, you know, a thousand miles to the West to a land that they had never seen before. And they were given these old houses, uh, the, these houses that had been uh, Germans uh, that had belonged to Germans. Um, and you get this, so now in Western Poland is this weird kind of mix of, of um, different, uh, I guess, you know, I guess you could say ethnicities. That's probably not the right word to use. Um, but um, it's, it's this weird hybrid space now of, I mean, even today, if you go out to the countryside in Western Poland, um, if you if you go to like a little village and you look at the storefronts, you can still make out behind the paint, you can still make out some German lettering um, that was there before the war. Um, and then they've slapped the Polish on over it. They've tried to paint over it, but sometimes this is still, you can still see through this. So this, this history, this already very old history um, is still, seeping through to the present in, in that part of Poland. And it, it's, it's a make, it makes for uh, a fascinating um, geopolitical space. Um, so anyway, I could, I could talk about that forever, but that's not really the point of this, uh, of this lecture. So back to the communist system itself. So it got to be this absurd system over time um, in which no one, no one really believed in it. Even the apparatchiks, the people who, you know, the, the government officials who um, were party members, um, uh, you know, uh, members of the bureaucracy, they went, they, they continued to go through the motions of the system because there was nothing else to do. It became, it became this weird, um, uh, inauthentic um way of living for everyone. They just, they, you know, no one knew any other way to live. People just assumed this was how it was going to be. But it just wasn't working by the end. It was just, you know, uh, the economy had gone through these huge failures. Um, the, the country was deeply in debt. Um, and, but few people had any idea what else to do. And so you just, you just did your, you just did your thing every day. You just got up and you were a, uh, you were a, a mid-level, you know, party functionary um, in some, you know, kind of unnecessary part of the bureaucracy. And that's, but that was just what you did. Um, and a, a lot of the reason behind this is because how of how the truth was constantly changing. What was official truth was never fixed, right? Uh, and, you know, as good postmodernists, we know that there is ultimately no one truth, but at the same time, at least you can, you know, at least there are some ideas that you know remain kind of fixed at least superficially that you can you know function <laughs> through which you can function you know in your everyday life in communist europe this truth was always uh shifting and one really good example is the idea of stalin stalin as um the hero and the leader of the people right the hero of the people the the the, the kindly grandfather uh who you know you could look up to right um, and in 1953, when he died, this idea of him being the hero of communist Eastern Europe 
changes almost overnight. Um, not long after he dies, um, Khrushchev, uh, the new party leader, holds this secret but not really secret meeting. Basically, he allows all the, the notes of the meeting to be leaked, but um, it was supposed to be secret, um, in which he decries Stalinism uh, to all the, the, you know, the big leaders of, of communist Eastern Europe. And he says, you know, Stalin, you know, what Stalin did was wrong. Uh, the famines in Ukraine, the mass executions, the gulag, all this is, is just wrong. Uh, he, he, we, you know, we're, we're not going to think of him as, an, as a hero anymore. And so overnight, so for the longest time, um, authors were expected to write, you know, stories in which Stalin is a hero. You're expected to make movies in which Stalin is, is, the, is the deus ex machina, you know, the god from the machine who comes down and fixes everything. Um, and now, all of a sudden, after this proclamation by Khrushchev, you're now sus suspect as an author. If you wrote a poem that, you know, said Stalin is, you know, was a great leader, now you're sus suspect by this new communist regime. Um, now you could be shipped off because you support Stalin, right? Um, and a great like visual representation of this, um, and I'm not going to bother bringing it up here, but you know, showing it, you can Google it easily enough. Uh, if you just look up um, Stalin statue Prague, um, while Stalin was alive, they built this huge uh, uh, stone monument to Stalin in Prague. It was gigantic. Um, very socialist, realist, you know, very blocky, you know, um, and almost right after he dies, not long after he dies, they blow it up and there are pictures of it being blown up. Um, because now after what Khrushchev had to say, you couldn't associate yourself with Stalin. And so the shifting, I, the shifting truth, um, you know, Stephen Colbert said, you know, he, he coined the phrase truthiness, right? That's what people living in uh, Central and Eastern Europe at the time had had to. That's how they had to exist. They had to exist in truthiness, not truth. And so this ever shifting um, uh, reality uh, becomes just you know over time just becomes a burden, and uh, it becomes impossible to truly you know to to exist in any um, uh, functional way. You know, people. I mean, it's this kind of you know. Uh, uh, geopolitical psychosis that happens in the area. Um, so let's um, let's move on. I'll talk more about the failures. Yeah, you know, and it, it always kind of breaks my heart a little bit. This unit when I talk about these things because you know I'm a leftist. I mean I, I'm a you know I, I'm a I'm a big lefty, but you know I'm not going to sit here and try to defend Stalin or the Soviet Union. I mean it's you know. Um, that would be ludicrous to to attempt to do. Um, so it, it always kind of you know it always kind of breaks my heart a little bit to to have to you know um, to criticize you know the you know the the longest so far um, uh, you know lo longest living you know largest uh, experiment in, in in leftism really is is what happens in Central and Eastern Europe and it just you know it it just it's a miserable failure. So um, let's go on to the work we're reading. So um, maybe the most important thing to keep in mind with the works we read for this unit, um, and it's kind of how I structure. I mean, it's it, it kind of structured the, um, the the selection, my selections for for this um, is satire. Satire is the is the core of the stories we read for this unit. Um, uh, they they use a metaphorical critique to um, to uh, uh, criticize to analyze uh, the communist system of the time. So satire and metaphorical critique is very important. You, if you want to satirize the the nation, if you want to criticize the the the, the communist state. You couldn't do it openly. That was very forbidden. You would first of all, you, you weren't going to get published anyway, and second of all, you could probably end up in jail. Um, but if you were if you were really good, if you were really great at it, you could use satire um, to get around, you know, the the the, the official censor. Uh, because you know, to be honest, 
often the sensor wasn't that bright anyway. Um, they were communists are very literal people. <laughs> so if you use satire and absurdity, and you'll see a lot of absurdity, especially in our next uh, uh, next lecture. Um, you could get around the censor and still critique the, uh, and get published, but still critique the state. Um, and so that's very important to the, um, to the work we look at today. So one thing I wanted to show you, spend a little time on, is this movie Meek. So Meek is this, um, it's kind of an impossible, um, uh, Kind of an impossible film to watch, really. Um, it's uh, it comes out in 1980, um, kind of at the height of um, of uh, Soviet domination in in the region, and really the height of the Cold War. Um, I mean, I remember the 80s being just full, just very tense. Um, I mean, I remember growing up as a kid, whenever the town uh, siren would go off, you know, for like you know, the first Tuesday every month to test it. You know, one of the jokes among us kids was, oh my God, Reagan dropped the bomb, you know. Uh, so um, this, you know, th this is living in that moment was really, really frightening at times. The only way you could deal with it was laugh. Um, so Misha is this absurdist, grotesque, I think grotesque is a really great way to put it, uh, film that is impossible to watch if you don't know the language or the culture. Um, I tried to show it to a, a class one time and every, literally every other minute I had to pause it and give like a two minute long explanation about why this was funny. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a moment where in the very beginning of the movie, uh, police um, have set up this fake town with just like a few buildings and some uh, uh, mannequins. It, it, you know, sitting on porches and stuff, or inside, you know, these fake shops. They're just, you know, literally like like um, Hollywood style, like um, uh, lots, you know, or a lot, you know, where you just put up, you know, three three walls and a little paint. Um, and then they start stopping people in the road to give them tickets, and. You know, why? There, this, this makes no, you know, as an American uh, viewer of any time period, this would make no sense. What you have to know is that the law in Poland, at least at the time, was uh, about speeding was um, if you're on a highway and you come into a, a, a town of any kind, no matter how small a village, you have to slow down immediately um, and then make your way through, right? Um, and so they, it's it's a it's it was a traffic trap. It was basically a traffic trap to get you know in order to make money, uh, to make quick money for the state to uh, ticket these drivers who didn't know that there was a town there and suddenly they're going through a town. So you know a Polish viewer would see them, they they chuckle their heads off. Uh, an American viewer sees them, they have no idea what's going on. So it's it's even in 1980, it is an impossible movie for an American viewer. Um, but a, uh, a clip I want to share with you, um, I think really um, uh, illustrates and critiques the, you know, this grotesqueness of this moment quite well. So in this scene, um, this guy goes into a bar malechna. So bar malechna means milk bar. Um, and actually milk bars are quite popular these days. Um, they have been for a while. Um, a milk bar, it, you, you know, it, it, when they first started, they were where you went to get dairy. Like you could get a glass of milk, you could get cheese, that kind of thing. Uh, but they kind of grew up to be more like uh, small, they developed into more like uh, small eateries. Um, states, uh, state funded, not funded. Um, uh, basically, there's a better word, partially funded by the state. Um, where the state gives them, you know, some money to, you know, in order to offset uh, costs of them. Um, and they're still around today. And in fact, they're one of the best places in Poland to eat. Um, if you want like a, a good uh, home style Polish cooked meal, you go to a milk bar. Um, they're really quite, I mean, for like literally like $3, you can get a full meal and, you know, 
they are, uh, they're even today, they're still um, uh, subsidized. They're still subsidized by the, by, by the government. And I actually remember uh, when I was living in Poland, um, they, there was a, a, a short-lived uh, movement by the government. They were going to stop subsidizing the milk bars. And it put everyone in the streets protesting this move. And it, and it wasn't just, you know, like poor people. It was students, doctors, um, uh, railroad workers, you know, blue collar, white collar. All these people were in the streets protesting this because they all loved this institution of the Polish milk bar. And really the client, clientele is, uh, you know, is uh, people from uh, the entire spectrum of, of, socio of the socioeconomic scale. Um, so they're really, I think they're, they're really kind of an amazing institution. At the time, however, during communism, um, the milk bars were very poorly. They basically, they sold whatever was available at that time. So here he's getting what is called, what he called groats or buckwheat basically. Um, but this really kind of shows you the kind of brutish character that, that, that communist Poland ended up turning into um, and really a lot of Eastern Europe, so. Oh, I forgot to share the sound. Okay, we should do it. Ze smalcem. Nie ma smalcu, z dżemem są pire. Dobrze, niech będą. Proszę pani do mnie, pani. And I forgot to turn on the closed captions. So why don't we just start this over? Share computer sound. Turn on. There we go. Pire ze smalcem. Nie ma smalcu, z dżemem są pire. Dobrze, niech będą. Proszę pani do mnie, pani podejdzie. Zaraz! Niech pani wróci tu jeszcze. Gryczano. Numer 78, miejsce 13, stolik 3. No i co tak grzebie? Jeszcze talerz przekręci. Do widzenia. Do widzenia. Numery. 78. A ja 74, tylko w Kimblu byłem. Ty uważaj! So, uh, it's not difficult. <laughs> to understand the the uh, the commentary here, right? Um, and what's really weird is that it, this movie was allowed to be um, created at all. Um, but um, I think the fact that it was so utterly absurd, that it was so over the, to over the top grotesque, that's how it made it past the censors, right? It is so obviously a critique of Polish communist society and, and, and the kind of brutish life that, uh, that uh, Soviet communism created in, in Poland. But if you, if you did it so over the top, you could get away with it, right? Now, if it had been a serious movie about you know, the, the, uh, the, the dire consequences of living in Poland at the time, that, that wouldn't have gotten through. But to make something this weird and absurd, you know, that, that was fine because it was, it was just too humorous. Although it was a, it is a serious critique of the culture, so. Um, but let's get to the uh, stories we're reading. We uh, read for for today. Um, the first is by Jerzy Andrzejewski, and we looked at a different story by him earlier uh, during the uh, World War II and Holocaust unit. Uh, he lived nineteen oh nine to nineteen eighty three, um, and. In his early life, he is a true believer in communism. Um, he, during the uh, war, he was a he was a member of a of a communist um, aligned uh, underground 
um, uh, group, paramilitary group. He um, he was really popular at the time, because you know a lot of the stuff he wrote was all you know uh, it was all in support and kind of praise of uh, underground fighters and whatnot. Um, and afterwards, he ends up he ends up you know after the war he continues to write a lot of stuff um, um, promoting you know the you know, the communists of Poland and whatnot. But he ends up um, falling out. With the with the party, uh, he ends up losing faith in the party, and in 1956 he finally leaves uh, the Communist Party. Um, but he continues to write afterwards, and the story we look at today, uh, the Gold Fox, um, is a you know is a is an obvious critique of the system. So. Um, The probably the core theme of the story is this uh, the um, stifling of imagination that the communist bureaucracy and communist society um, uh, instills in, in people. So it's told that this this point is made through the character of a young boy who. What I assume is that he, in the beginning of the story, when he first sees the gold fox, he um, he's probably sick. He probably has like a fever, and so he hallucinates something, you know. But then later, when he, you know, when he's no longer sick, he still claims to see this gold fox, and basically, it's the same thing as like having, you know, a kid having an imaginary friend. It's completely harmless. It's actually a, a sign of a, a, of an imaginative mind. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it this becomes a serious um, problem for his family, right? The fact that he has this imaginary friend uh, is 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 serious business, right? Because you can't have an imagination in this system, right? Having an imagination is it, it, being creative um, could very well get you sent to prison. I mean, you know, this is this the this is, having this kind of imagination um, could um, you know, have serious consequences. Um, so, you know, at every turn, his family tries to get him to admit that he never saw a gold fox, right? Uh, a really good scene is with his older brother. They start, you know, using their boys or whatever uh, blocks to create a, a to create a town, right? And the main character, the, the, the main character, the, the younger uh, brother, he starts you know, just kind of building things all over the place, right? With no system or anything, right? It's just, he's having fun, right? That's what childhood is supposed to be. It's supposed to be fun. So he's playing. The brother though, the older brother says, oh no, you're doing it wrong, right? You have to have the streets this way. There has to be a grid system, right? We need the party headquarters over here because that's where they're supposed to be. You're, you know, the schools are supposed to be over here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, that is the point of the story. Then is 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 a discussion of a critique of how the imagination becomes stifled in this um, bureau, uh, this communist bureaucracy, uh, bureaucratic society, really. Um, um, uh, this technocratic um, regime. That this is the kind of thing that this is the kind of person this this regime creates is this unimaginative, um, hard. Uh, person who doesn't believe in imagination. Um, so that's that would be the all I'll say about that. I mean, we can discuss more about this in our discussions. Um, the next author we look at is Marek Watsko. So he is uh, he lived in uh, 1934 to 1969. Uh, he is um, kind of a Tragic James Dean kind of figure in Polish uh, culture. Early on, he make he makes a big splash in society. Um, his his works gain a lot of notoriety. Notoriety. He wins uh, some awards, but he becomes an alcoholic um, quite early on. Uh, he only lived uh, thirty five years. He was only thirty five when he died. Um, he ended up. Uh, he, uh, going to the United States at one point, he fell, falls out of favor with Pol uh, Polish society because of his drunken behavior, mostly. Um, and in um, 
in America. He ends up um, getting in trouble with um, with basically with like Hollywood elites. He has an affair uh, with with a um, um, a person uh, a, a, a somewhat uh, with the wife of a um, of someone in uh, big in Hollywood. So he his trouble just follows him his entire life because of this. Um, he ends up dying very early. Um, I cannot. Re I should have put this in my notes, but he actually accidentally causes the death of a friend. Um, they're drunk and he they're on a ledge and he I can't remember the exact story and I don't have it in my notes, but he um, he pushes his fr a friend of his off a um, this overhang and the friend dies and not long after he ends up dying. He drinks himself to death basically. Um, so. I want to just quickly discuss a, a short novel of his to compare it to the story we read for today, because they really kind of follow, they really uh, discuss the same kind of um, theme. So the other novel of his, the short novel is The Eighth Day of the Week, and it's very short. It's, it's a slim little uh, novel. Um, but it basically is about like really the entire story follows this young couple uh, who try to find some, they're basically the entire story is, is of them trying to find a private place in order to make love. They're, they're trying to become intimate and they can't find anywhere. There's just no privacy to be had. And this is his critique of communist society is that in this society, there is no such thing as privacy. The individual gets lost in the mass. And so the ind you know, individual desires are unimportant. Right, when compared to the state, the desires of the state. And so this young couple, just trying to be young and in love, for the life of them, cannot find a place to express their love. Right. They're, at every mo at, at every turn, they're kept from this expression. <clears throat> and that's really what this story is about, then. Um, first step into the clouds. You know what? This is a novel as um, underlined. Um, so a first step into the clouds. So um, a curious thing about the title, really, the translation of the title, um, Niebo is both you know, the sky, uh, but it's also heaven. It also means par you know, heaven or paradise. Well, I guess Rai is paradise, so it could also mean heaven. So this, there's this play on the words, right? Um, and uh, what it's you know you know it, this statement that this phrase is a is a metaphor for sex really you know the first time someone has sex right this this, this uh, important um, intimate experience um, and again this couple is uh, kept from this young couple is kept from having this experience by brutes basically by two thuggish men who represent you know in, in very very real ways. Um, Communist, uh, communist society of the communist society of Poland. Um, for no reason, they're harassed by these two um, brutish men, and the boy is beaten up. Um, and the you know afterwards, when they the two uh, men send the two the two young people off, the discussion that the two men the short discussion the two men have really illustrates the kind of cynical existence Poles had. Um, had degenerated it into, right? Um, you know, they, you know, they reminisce shortly about how, oh yeah, I, you know, uh, I remember that uh, having this youthful moment myself, but uh, you know, now that I'm this wrecked old man, I'm not going to allow anyone else to have this kind of um, pleasure. So it's it's a very it's a very depressing series of uh, stories. Um, so <clears throat> the final author is Stanislav Lem. Uh, he, he lived from 1921 to 2006, actually. He lived quite a while. Um, so Stanislav Lem is still um, read today um, around the world. He was um, one of the first um, popular science fiction authors in Poland. And uh, 
a work that you may have come across of his or at least heard of is Solaris. Um, and this was uh, made into a movie uh, a few times. First, it was a, a Russian movie. Um, and then most recently, it had, it's a, uh, a movie was made of it with uh, George Clooney. Let me look up the exact date. Uh, Clooney, Solaris, 2002. So it was, you know, 18 years ago, I think. For me, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, um, it is a, it is a popular sci-fi novel still. It's translated into several languages around the world. Um, and it's probably his most important work. So what this work, what Solaris in particular, and what a lot of his work really, um, uh, the, the theme of a lot of his work is how ultimately it is impossible to, for humans to understand each other, to really understand anything, you know, in, in an ultimate sense, like to, it, you know, no, no matter how close you, you, you get to a person, you're never going to 100% understand them. And there's this, there's this gulf of misunderstanding that exists between humans for various reasons, you know, language, uh, culture, um, individual experiences, right? They, they all, you know, create this huge rift between people. Um, <clears throat> and Solaris then is, is a kind of, uh, is, is a way of talking about that. So the, the core of the story is, you know, he actually said one time that, um, you know, all of the uh, versions of the, the novel that have been made in movies are were completely wrong. Like no one really got what Solaris was about. So Solaris in the story is this planet that humans discover in the future. It's this, um, and, but it's basically a, a, a living organism. It, it's this one large life form, planet-sized life form. Um, and when humans discover it, they begin studying it. And they begin to study the minutia of it. Like if there's like a ripple across it, they, they try to interpret what it might mean. And um, it's kind of funny, like over the hundreds of years that they're studying it, they, they build a, a space station out there and it creates entire academic fields of study about, you know, it's called Polaris studies, right? Um, so you, uh, you, know, you, as an academic in some field, you go up there and you try to study it, but the point that he makes in it is that no one actually ever understands it. Like people think they understand it or they think they have some inkling of what's going on, but ultimately they have no clue what's going on with it. Um, and he, and he you know, makes this clear to the reader as a, as a third person narrator that you know, these people are you know, studying every little thing about Solaris, but in the end they have no, they're completely wrong. You know, every, every assumption they make about this life form is is utterly uh, misplaced. They, they you know they 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 actually don't come to any kind of understanding. And you know, it, it's it's uh, you know I, it, it's an easy way to you know an easy reading to make of it, an easy analysis of this story. The point, uh, as far as a point he's making, is this misunderstanding between people. But also, you know, in a in a bigger sense, you know, he he loves science fiction. He loved the you know he loved science. He loved the idea of futurism. You know, the, when we actually meet uh, alien life forms, um, and what he you know he's also kind of warning us that um, you, we're not going to be able to understand alien societies when we meet them. You know, Star Wars, Star Trek, they're kind of um, they're they're actually rather dishonest representations of what it'll be like to meet um alien alien uh societies because the the um uh the in, infinite number of possibilities of the way um a life form comes into being and you know maybe evolves or you know a society is created around these life forms means that you know more than likely when we come across them we won't have we, we may not even know their life forms you know, we may not even know that these are, that they're conscious beings, right? Um, so it's kind of a warning about, uh, you know, how we won't be able to understand anyone out in the cosmos when we meet them. Um, so the story we read from uh, Lem is The 13th Voyage. And again, with this unit, keep in mind that this is a satire. 
and specifically uh, a satire of the communist of communist society in Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. So when you read, keep that in mind. So for example, um, it's all about, you know, what he's satirizing is the bureaucracy, the, the bureaucratic, um, the bureaucracy, <laughs> so uh, bureaucratic um, regime that has been put in place by communism. So for example, um, he comes to what, you know, the, this, this main character, it, basically this, uh, before I get off track, um, this is part of a larger collection called the Star Diaries. Um, and it follows uh, E. Jean, I don't know how you pronounce it, E. Jean, e. e. Jean Kiki, I suppose, um, on his journeys throughout the universe. Um, and this 13th voyage, he comes across these two different societies and so one of them is it, it's it's supposed to be funny. You're supposed to laugh when you read this story. I mean, it, it is it is a comedy, really, but it is also a serious critique. Um, so, for example, he comes to one society in which they're trying to force evolution on their people by almost drowning. So they they they, they exist in a constant state of near drowning. Right? They live in water, and they you know they live water up to their nose so they can keep breathing, but they're expected to try to talk through the water with bubbles and whatnot. Um, and so it's this absurd forced, uh, absurd attempt to, to force evolution on people. So this then is, you know, this is an obvious commentary on the um, pressures uh, the communist regime put on its people it, to conform to certain impossible ways of being so um so yeah that is that is the end of this part of communism in poland um oh you know what i did want to mention the there are a couple videos on uh our sakai site one is um so how to do this. So you should look up. I'll talk more about this next time, too, because really it comes at the end of, of communism. You know what I think? Well, anyway, the uh, two videos are about martial law in Poland. And uh, martial law is this um, moment in Poland in um, 1981, December 13, uh, 13 1981, um, in which the communist authorities enact martial law, meaning uh, they put very strong, I mean, you think COVID uh, restrictions are, are tough. This was, there were the very early curfews. Phones were disconnected for a long time. The TV basically was uh, static for a long time. Uh, meetings of 10 or more people were outlawed. Um, and it was all a crackdown on uh, union, uh, one particular union, but also other groups um, as basically the last, this was really the, the beginning of the end of communism in, in, in Poland and Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and it lasts until, um, July 22nd, 19, 1983. <clears throat> and um, so I will talk more about this moment in the next lecture, but for now, um, you could, you might watch those videos. Uh, it'll give you this kind of, there are these kind of, you know, the, the one where there's one where General Jaruzelski, who's the leader of communist Poland is announcing martial law. And it is this weird moment for polls. You're so imagine, you know, it's near Christmas, you're watching the TV, and all of a sudden your your leader comes on the on the TV and says, starting today, I'm enacting a martial law. Um, you know, and he goes on this short speech, and then there's just static on the TV. Your phone stops working. Um, there are soldiers in the streets, there are tanks in the streets, and you know. What kind of absurd moment must that be for your existence? Um, so just keep that in mind as you watch these. I probably put these in the wrong 
day, but anyway, it's fine. Um, and finally, I wanted to say, um, I am very impressed with your work so far. Um, I finally got caught up on the discussion forums. A um, lot of great ideas. Everyone's doing really well on those. And um, I start. I haven't gotten to the midterms yet, but I, I looked over just a, a, a few that have been turned in early, and I'm really impressed. I, I'm really happy with the um, with the work you're all you're all doing. You're it's solid, good work. So, um, congratulations on that. I'm, I'm really uh, uh, happy with it. Um, anyway, um, have a good day, and I will see you later.